Good morning, everybody. Thanks a lot, uh, thanks a lot David, for this great presentation, uh, this great speech with a lot of great pictures and slides. And I will keep this one because I think the title is also appropriate for my presentation. Um, oh, really, I'm not joking. It's just, I think, uh, it's w when you talk, okay, when you talk about the global economy at the moment, the outlook is also very shaky. And, and to, be, to tell you the truth, the outlook is not very rosy. So that's why I was saying that your, the title of your last slide is also very appropriate to, uh, to, to, to it. Basically, you know, you know the global context. It's not really surprising. We're still stuck in an environment of quite low growth with low inflation. And central banks are trying to revive growth by using a lot of tools, but, but they don't achieve to do it. And look at the Bank of Japan, for example. It has started to buy stocks just to try to revive business confidence and, sense, and, see, and then to, to have an impact on the real economy, but it doesn't work. And the problem is more and more countries in the world right now are looking like Japan. So what does that mean for businesses? First, when you look at it this way, it's not really good news because when you're in an environment where GDP growth is low and inflation is low, it means for businesses that demand is low and their pricing power is low as well. So in terms of credit risk, it's not really good news. And this is what you see on the, on the right-hand chart here, where we try to look at credit risk for businesses all around the world by looking at our country risk assessment. So to do that, we, we look at, of course, our, tech, our payment experience at COFAS. We also look at a very large range of macroeconomic and financial indicators and our own business assessment, a business environment assessment. When you combine all of this, and then when you combine all countries, you get this index on the right, on the right slide. So don't look at the scale. It doesn't mean anything. Let's, let's say it, this is only the, let's say the average country risk rating for the world. And you see that, according to us, country risk has never been as high as it is today. And, and even right after the Lehman crisis, credit risk for businesses wasn't as high as it is today. And of course, there are plenty of reasons behind this. Um, when you look at it on a country by country basis, the picture is the same. Here you see our country risk assessment and from A1 to D, so it's a seven grade scale. And of course, when it's in red, it means risk is elevated and you're not surprised to see a lot of red in the, in the map. So all in all, it reflects growing problems in emerging markets, mostly. Uh, over, the past, over the past six months, we have downgraded 15 countries. And once again, we, we, didn't, we didn't downgrade any, uh, so many countries since, uh, since 2009. And of course, it reflects a lot of problems in, in emerging markets. Structural ones, I mean, over the past five years, we have seen more and more infrastructure issues in emerging markets, more and more problems for businesses related to a labor cost, related to corruption. So this is not new. And in addition to this, of course, there were this huge shock on commodity prices that started in, in mid-2014. So all in all, when you combine all of this, GDP growth for emerging markets has been divided by two over the past decade. So this is a huge, huge shock. So we started last year by downgrading a number of countries in Latin America and in Africa. And since the starting of the year, I mean, concerts have moved more to the Middle East and to, and to Asia. So what what, what can ex how can we explain this big shift on, on emerging markets? Of course, the commodity price shock, as I said, I mean, and the shock on, on GDP goals. But there are plenty of other issues. I mean, especially, perhaps the most important one at the moment is one we don't talk uh, much about, is corporate debt. Corporate debt in emerging markets has been multiplied by 4.5 over the past decade, 4.5. I mean, we have talked a lot about household debt in the US during the subprime crisis, then about public debt in Europe. But now the biggest issue is corporate debt in emerging markets. And the reason why, I mean, corporate debt has surged in emerging markets over the past decade is mostly, uh, is mostly I mean, very loose monetary policies from, from central banks in these countries over the past decade. I mean, right after the Lehman crisis, a lot of central banks in emerging markets decided to cut rates. 
a little bit like in the UK, in the US, and in, in the Eurozone. Nothing, I mean, this is a normal move, I would say. Then the problem is when growth recovered from 2010, central banks in a lot of emerging markets didn't hike rates back. So we were in a situation where on the one side, the supply of credit was very high because of very low interest rates. On the other side, the demand for credit was very high as well because growth was recovering. So all in all, when you combine all of this, it, it, the, the result is very simple. I mean, credit growth surged in a lot of emerging markets and, and a lot of corporates got indebted for almost for free. The second reason why corporate debt surged in, in, in a lot of emerging markets is uh, the development of bond markets. So this is, a, once again, this is a positive move because after all the emerging market crisis we saw in the 90s, a lot of emerging countries decided to diversify the way corporates could, could get funding and, and so that they, they don't rely only on banks. But the problem is that over the past, over the past couple of years, after the crisis, there were these huge amount of liquidity coming from advanced economies to emerging markets, and a lot of corporates got indebted also almost for free because of this huge amount of liquidity coming from, from our countries, from the UK, from Europe, and from the US. So all in all, the problem is that now we see in more and more countries that corporate debt has risen to unsustainable levels. And this is what you see on this chart. When you look at corporate debt levels, it's very different from one country to another. This is what you see on the X uh, axis. Okay, you, you see countries where corporate debt to GDP ratio is low, in some other is, uh, it's high. But in all countries, look at the, the Y axis, corporate debt uh, has increased significantly over the, past, over the past years. So of course, the situations are very different from one country to another. You see Turkey on the top, uh, then you see Brazil, Russia, which are also the usual suspects. And, and it means that in these countries, risks related to, to corporate debt is, is, of course, uh, is of course higher. And last but not least, you see a very small country uh, on, the, on the top right of the, of the chart. We couldn't even put it on the same scale as the other ones, which is China. And, and that's why this is by far the biggest risk at the moment in, uh, in, in China. Over the past couple of months in the news, there have been a lot of articles, a lot of comments saying that growth is stabilizing in China, and finally the situation is not perhaps so bad as we, as we could have imagined last year. To, just to tell you the truth very simplistically, I mean, we don't buy this scenario. Just because the only reason why growth is stabilizing is China is because since the starting of the year, the central bank has asked to, uh, to large commercial banks to lend more to over-indebted corporates. So it's true that in the very short term, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a relief, but only in the very short term. And, and the strategy of the central bank and of, of the Ministry of Finance has already changed. When you look at the data coming from banks in April or May, it looks like credit conditions have already restarted to, to tighten because the central banks is just realizing that it's not sustainable. Credit growth is twice higher than GDP. So it's not, it can't last. And another way to look at it is this annual survey COFAS makes every year. So we ask to Chinese corporates a very large number of questions, especially on their, uh, on their payment conditions. And the last one is very interesting. Uh, you, can, you can look at the full result on, on our website, by the way. And it's, it's very interesting because it's another way to look at these uh, payment problems for, for businesses uh, in, in China. So what you can see on the left-hand chart is that more and more corporates are saying they suffer from very long overdues from their clients. In other words, you see, the, you see on the, on the left-hand chart that 10% of businesses in China are saying the average, I, I say, the average overdue they suffer from is higher than five months. So it's huge, and it twice, it's twice higher than it used to be last year. And so the consequence is very simple. You see it on the right, on the right part of the slide. I mean, for these corporates, of course, the, 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 the share of their turnover which is impacted by this overdue is increasing. So now, I mean, 18% of businesses are saying that this very long overdue will account for more than 5% of GDP. So then, if you realize that about 80% of this overdue won't be repaid back, 
you realize that a lot of corporates will, ha will face, are facing liquidity issues, and then it means, uh, it means negative consequences for the suppliers, and so on. So we're right in the middle of this vicious cycle uh, in China, and if you look beyond the macroeconomic surface, I would say, and if you look beyond the usual cyclical indicators like retail sales, industrial productions, uh, and so on, you realize the situation is not improving at all, and, and, and we could get some negative surprise um, uh, during, the, the, during the second half of the year. So, just to, just to continue on this, we, we make exactly the same survey for, for the rest of Asia, and the outcome is, uh, is also very interesting. Because, of course, problems are not as high in the rest of Asia as they are in, in China, but it turns out that we see also more and more, uh, more, and more payment issues in, the, in some other countries in the rest of Asia, like India, like Singapore, or like some other countries. And when you look at it on a sector-by-sector -sector basis, this is what you see here on this slide, the situation is also pretty different from one sector to another. So you won't be surprised to see that sectors like uh, industry, like the textile, like the metals, are, are facing more and more overdue issues. And if you have to keep in mind one sector which is suffering a lot at the moment, from this issue, this is the one you see in the bubble, and this is construction. By far, this is a sector where, uh, where, the, where the, the problems related to long overdues uh, seem to be the most significant one in, in Asia at the moment. So this is not surprising, uh, because I go back to what I said a few minutes ago. Uh, corporate debt in the construction sector is the highest uh, in, in, in the region. And, and it means that, of course, in the long term, we're still positive. There are still a lot of potentials related to urbanization and so on. But in the short term, it means that all these sectors will face, and, and the construction sector in particular, will face a lot of problems, uh, especially, in, uh, especially in Asia, and especially because in a lot of countries in Asia, household debt is very, is very high. And so it, uh, it, uh, it limits the potential of growth for the construction sector in the, in the very short term. So, another consequence uh, related to, uh, to this corporate debt issue is that now bank credit conditions in a lot of emerging markets are tightening, not only in Asia, but in a lot of regions. On this chart, you see the outcome of a survey which is made on a quarterly basis by the Institute of International Finance. So, on a quarterly basis, they asked a, a, a large number of questions to a large number of banks in all emerging market regions. And so how you can read it? You can read it by looking at the, the limit, which is 50. When the score is below 50, it means that the bulk of banks are saying that they are tightening credit conditions for businesses in the region. When it's above 50, they're saying they are, they are easing uh, they are, they are, I mean, they are, they, are not, they are not tightening credit conditions for, for businesses. And so the trend is, is pretty clear on this chart. In all regions but one, you see that credit conditions are tightening. And so it's, it's related to what I said. I mean, banks are more, are more and more reluctant to lend to over-indebted businesses. And another factor is also related in some specific regions to the importance of public deposit. In some specific regions, like for example the Middle East, and this is a tricky issue we see at the moment, the banking sector relies a lot on public deposits. It means that when the government is, uh, is facing more and more problems because it gets less and less revenues because oil prices go down, for example in the Middle East, it means that public deposits go down and bank banks have to tighten their credit conditions. And this is also an issue we, we are seeing at the moment in a, in, a, in a number of countries in emerging markets. So when you combine all of this, this is another reason why credit risk remains uh, quite tricky in a lot of countries. So I'm, I'm, I'm almost done with the bad news. Now I'm going to start with, 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 by talking with, about good news. And, and the first good news, you, you see it on this chart. I mean, there is one exception, which is uh, Central and Eastern Europe. This is the only one region at the moment where, where, where credit conditions uh, are, not, are not tighter, according to, according to this survey. And, and by the way, I think it, it really it's a confirmation of, of what we see on the ground and what we see uh, by looking at macroeconomic figures. 
This is by far the bright spot at the moment in the emerging world. Why? Because in a lot of Central and Eastern Europe countries, uh, of course, as you know, they rely a lot on, on Western Europe, and now it's a kind of a, it's a kind of a good news. You see on the right-hand chart, I mean, the share of exports of Central and Eastern Europe countries going to, to Europe. Uh, finally, I mean, we could have we could have imagined that the region would have been impacted by what's going on in Russia, but it's not. Uh, be simply because uh, because I mean, the region doesn't trade much with uh, with Russia. And last but not least, we, we see in a lot of countries in the region that the middle class is expanding, unemployment is going down, wages, uh, wages, wages go up. So all in all, the two big engines of growth in the region, which is private consumption and exports, do quite well at the moment. So, of course, the situation is pretty good compared to other emerging markets. This is also the only one region uh, in the emerging world which doesn't rely on oil. So when oil prices go down, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a good news and not a bad news. Now the key question is what could, uh, what could limit this potential and what, could, what, what are the risks at the moment for the region? I think there are two. The first one is China. It's a paradox because when you look at the right chart, of course, it's true that China is not a major trading partner for, for, for Central and Eastern Europe, but it could have an impact on the region if it has a negative impact on countries like Germany, for example. So that's, another, that's, that's, one, that's the first risk. And the second one, uh, which, have to, which we have to, to, to monitor at the moment, is also on the, on the political side. There have been a lot of government changes over the past, over the past months and quarters in the region. And in some of them, uh, of course, we, ha we will have to monitor uh, what's going on for, for businesses, especially, for example, in Poland, where we have, we have seen over the past months that there have been some measures that have been announced, and, and they, they are not necessarily very positive for, uh, for businesses. So this is something we, we have to monitor, but at the moment, I mean, the situation is still, uh, is still pretty good. And as I said, I mean, the first rationale behind this is that Central and Eastern Europe countries are driven by what's going on in Western Europe. And nothing new, nothing really new on this side, but I mean, on the business, on the business side, we still see a lot of positive news uh, coming, from, coming from Western Europe. Corporate profits go up uh, because of the past depreciation of the euro, because of uh, lower oil prices, of course, because of some government measures to boost corporate profits, for example, in, in, in France. So all in all, on the corporate side, the situation is definitely much better, and you see it on the left-hand chart with, uh, with, with corporate insolvencies. And last year, uh, last year we were exactly in the same situation, where we, were, we, we started to see that lower oil prices started to have a positive impact on, on corporate profits and on GDP growth. And at that time, I made a very simple comparison. I compared the Eurozone with a car, and I was saying it's, it's very simple. At the moment, it's true that we see that the car restarts. But the car was restarting one year ago only because it was, it was pushed behind by two guys, and one was oil, and the second one was, uh, was the euro. And I was saying but we're still very cautious because at the same time, the engine, which is investment, has not restarted yet. The good news one year later is that it has. I mean, investment, we see more and more signs of investment picking up in a lot of countries in the region. Spain, of course, but it's not new. Germany, even Italy and France do better. So all in all, I mean, the situation, it's true, is, uh, is definitely better. So now the, the key question is what could, what could make the car stall? Um, I would say the first one is a little bit like for Central and Eastern Europe, China, of course. This is a key risk uh, for, for, for Europe. And the second one, and we go back to the previous presentation, of course, it's politics. There are a lot of political risks at the moment in, in Europe, of course, including the, the UK referendum. The Greek drama is not over. There have been positive steps over the past weeks, but it's definitely not over. It's uh, what has been decided on May 25. It's once again a short-term fix, and, and it doesn't solve the issue in the, in the long term. So we, in, the, in the months and in the quarters to come, we will still hear about uh, what's going on in Greece. 
Uh, as you know, there are going to be elections in Germany by the end of the year at the local level, general ones next year, the same in France next year, and of course, the Spanish election by the end of the month. So all of these political events, all of these political uncertainties, sorry, have a common point, which is, uh, which is migration and immigration. This topic is having an impact on all political issues in all Europe uh, at the moment. So, first of all, it started with, uh, with financial issues. I mean, there are a lot of social concerns related to the financial costs about immigration. And the paradox is, I mean, we all know that in the long term, we need more immigration in Europe if we want to avoid a kind of a Japan-style Japan stagnation. But, it's, but of course, I mean, in the short term, it's also true that social concerns, I mean, prevail. And now the debate is much broader than financial costs related to, to, to immigration. I mean, we hear in the debate here in the UK, in France as well, in all countries in Europe, I mean, more and more concerns related to sovereignty, related to borders, related to culture, and so on. So, in the short term, it looks like when you look at this chart, I mean, a part of the, a part of the, a part of the, 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 the concerns related to immigration uh, is, has been solved because of the, the, the agreement with, with Turkey. And you see the number of arrivals in, in Greece uh, has fallen dramatically over the past couple of weeks. But nobody knows if this agreement is sustainable or not. And even if it is, I mean, it's unlikely that immigration will not be, uh, I mean, it's very likely that the immigration will still be a very topical issue and very topical uh, uh, problem in the, in the political debate in the, in the years to come in, in Europe. And these political uncertainties is having an impact on GDP growth already right now. I mean, when you look at political uncertainty indexes, uh, and when you look at it at their level before the crisis, and when you look at it right now, and then when you try to do a simple statistical model and to look at the correlation be between these political uncertainty indexes and GDP growth, you see that at the moment, GDP growth is cut in the Eurozone by around 0.2 to 0.3 point a year because of higher political uncertainty. So we have GDP growth, which is at about 1.5% at the moment. We could have we could have 1.7 or 1.8 uh, without without these political uncertainties. So this this is manageable, of course, but this is also something which is which is significant. And this is this is of course a key risk at the moment. So there are also some political uncertainties in the U.S. But beyond this, uh, the, the point I wanted to raise here is that uh, a little bit like in the U.K., the peak is definitely behind us. I mean, the recovery started more than six years ago. And we clearly see at the moment that the momentum is fading uh, in the US. You see corporate profits on the, on the left, and usually it's a pretty good leading indicator for, for GDP growth. So some people say, OK, but it's not really a big deal because corporate profits go down only because of the energy sector. It's not true. Only half of it is due to what's going on in the energy sector. So half of the decline is also due to what's going on on other sectors. And and beyond what's going on on the corporate side, it's true that even on the household side, we see also that the momentum is fading. Perhaps you've seen the last job report that came out last week. It's pretty bad. And all in all, I mean, we are not specifically, we're not very pessimistic on the US, but it's just that the catch-up process is over. You can see it on the, on the right part of the chart, on the chart of the slide uh, with car sales. I mean, over the past five years, car sales grew five, five to six percent a year because they were catching up. Now it's over. You can't, you can't expect the same kind of growth in the years to come. So it's just that we have to be used to see uh, two to three percent growth instead of five to six percent. And so all in all, for the whole U.S. economy, it means that GDP growth will be no more than 1.5 percent next year. And it's not bad, but it means that business insolvencies are, are going to start to, to, to increase. And so this will be my, my last word. A good way to, to summarize my presentation is to look at the situation not on a country-by-country -country basis, but on a sector-by-sector -sector basis. 
what we provide is sector risk assessments. So we look at our payment experience on a sector by sector basis. We also look at a large number of financial indicators, especially for listed companies all around the world. And we get, we get this four grade scale uh, from, from very low risk in, in green to very high risk in, uh, in black. And so basically it reflects uh, what I've just said. Look at North America, for example. We have just downgraded the car sector because of what I said uh, on, on the US. And if you look at it on a if you look at it on a sector by sector basis, you won't be surprised to see risk according to us is very elevated in metals, in the energy. And on the other side, the situation is much better in private consumption related sectors uh, like uh, like, for example, the pharmaceutical sector. And if you look at it on a region by region basis, once again, it reflects what I've just said. I mean, we see risks is mounting in emerging Asia. It's also increasing uh, in, uh, in, in the Middle East. It's still elevated in Latin America. And on the other side, uh, the level of risk is contained in Central and Eastern Europe and it's improving in Western Europe. Thank you.